Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our presence, wherever we are, participating in Know Your Feet. We thank you for being able to host this series to inform about and spread the Catholic faith to our sisters and brothers. We ask your blessings on our presenters, our listeners, those who facilitate this production, that we may be guided by your Holy Spirit in presenting and receiving your word. We pray that all who benefit may come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Catholic faith that will guide our living. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our brother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, viewers. Welcome to another session of Know Your Faith. In this series, we have been focusing on the four Marian dogmas as it relates to our devotion to Mary. So our presenter for this series on Marian devotion has been Father David Kahn, a Marian priest of the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. He is also um, a lecturer at St. John Vianney on Marian studies. And during this series, Father has been presenting the four Marian dogmas. He started with scriptia and tradition, locating Mary in both scriptia and the oral tradition of the church. His first um, dogma was divine motherhood. The second that he focused on was perpetual virginity. And last week he focused on the immaculate conception. This week, the final dogma, the fourth and final dogma to conclude the series will be the assumption of our Holy Mother into heaven. And so I present to you, Father David Kahn. We would like to begin tonight as we focus on the fourth Marian dogma, which is the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the fourth dogma, the assumption of Mary. For Catholic Christians, the belief in the assumption of Mary flows immediately from the belief in her immaculate conception. As last session, it was mentioned that these dogmas do not stand on their own only. They are all interrelated and interconnected. So Mary was immaculately conceived. So Catholic Christians believe that if Mary was preserved from sin by the free gift of God, she would not be bound to experience the consequences of sin debt in the same way we do. Because in Revelation chapter 21, verses 25, 27 rather, we read that nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. And what makes a person defile? Sin. So therefore, what God did for Mary at the Immaculate Conception, he does for us in baptism. He frees us from original sin. And being freed from original sin, Mary did not commit any personal sin. So therefore, she's undefiled. So being undefiled, she can enter into heaven. And likewise, unlike us, if we fall into sin, we need to be purified before entering into heaven. So Mary, from the Immaculate Conception, she was freed from sin. She died sinless. So hence the reason the consequence of Mary's death was different to us. So Mary's assumption shows the result of this freedom from sin, the immediate union of a whole being with her son, Jesus Christ, with God at the end of her life. So what is the theological 
development. On what basis does the church ask us to believe in this doctrine? Luigi Gambiro observed that disbelief is based on what we believe about Jesus. Again, for us to really understand Mary, we have to understand what are we saying about Jesus. And it is based on what we are saying about Jesus is what we believe about Mary. So this testifies on behalf of something that Christian tradition has always emphasized. The immediate connection between the mystery of Christ and the mystery of his mother Mary's bodily glorification in the eternal life expresses the church's faith in the final glorification of man. Saved by Jesus Christ, in the totality of his person, in the flesh of Christ, and in the flesh of Mary, both of whom were taken up into the glory of heaven. So Jesus was taken up into the glory of heaven. And so it is with Mary. The eschatological humanity of the redeemed is already present. So immediately is not whether Mary died, but it is really a question being taken up into heaven. Jesus died and he was taken up into heaven. And likewise, Mary dies and she is taken up into heaven. So the dogmatic constitution on the divine revelation, De Verbum, in the Second Vatican Council number nine, paragraph nine, it says to us, sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Our first session dealt with this, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, knowing that truth is revealed in both. And this is affirmed in De Verbum in the Second Vatican Council. They say that they are bound closely together and communicate with the other for both of them flowing out of the same divine wellspring. So scripture flows from the wellspring of God's grace. Divine revelation also flows from this wellspring of grace. And it comes together in some fashion to form one thing and move together towards the same goal. And what is this goal? The goal of truth. So therefore, the scripture is, review, is revealing truth. The tradition, as a church looks back at the tradition, the constant faith, the paradosis, it is looking for truth. So in paragraph 10, in Dei Verbum, thus it comes about that a church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Hence, both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. And when it comes to the dogma of Mary, the dogmas of Mary, it is where the scripture and the tradition really meets. So the sacred tradition and sacred scripture makes up a single sacred deposit of the word of God, which is entrusted to the church. It goes further to say, tradition may be recognized as a universal agreement that a truth has been revealed through the bishops of the world, church fathers, the constant teaching of the theologians, liturgy, as well as the belief and devotion of the faithful. So some doctrines are implicitly revealed in other doctrine, as for the instant, Mary assumption reflects upon Jesus's resurrection and the truth of the resurrection of the body. So therefore, it may not be implicitly revealed, but we know about the resurrection of Jesus, the truth of it, 
and bodily resurrection. So in short, Catholic Christians believe that the Blessed Virgin Mary at the end of her earthly life was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. That is what we are called to believe. In fact, in the rosary prayer, in the liturgy of the church, the rosary, in the fifth glorious mystery, we focus on the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Likewise, August 15th, every year, the church celebrates the feast, the solemnity of the Assumption of Mary. So what does the New Testament have to say? So the New Testament teaches us, therefore, just as through one person, sin entered the world, and through sin, death, and thus death came to all, in as much as all has sinned. So we know that death comes to all, just as sin comes to all, but it does not mean that all have to sin. Jesus did not sin. The Blessed Virgin Mary did not sin. And we, and we have an option not to sin, or we could choose sin. And sad to say, many people choose to sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that is a crucial part. The eternal life in Christ Jesus is a gift from God. So when we are freed from sin, we will be given that gift of life. So Mary did not sin. So she was given the gift of life, the resurrection of the body. But because Mary did not sin, she did not need a new body. So her body and soul undefiled was raised to the glory of God. So further, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 to 26, we read, For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead came also through a human being. For just as Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life. But each one in proper order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And this scripture is also linked to Revelation 12. In Revelation chapter 12, it speaks about the woman, the woman who dressed with the sun will bring about the one who will destroy sin and death. Her seed will bring about this, and they will cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So we see that woman in Revelation 12 is actually the Blessed Virgin Mary. The same woman mentioned in Genesis chapter 3 in the Old Testament as dealt with last day in the Immaculate Conception, the one that there is enmity between Satan, sin. So Mary is that person. So since sin and death are the fruits of Satan, the freedom of Mary from the original sin of Adam, the Immaculate Conception, also frees her from the consequences of sin also, because she did not sin. So there is no consequence of sin in her life. So that then Mary best fulfills the scripture of Genesis. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, Satan, and the woman, Mary, and between your offspring, the minion of Satan, and hers, Christ. He will strike at your head while you strike at his 
heal. So looking at Genesis 3.15 and Revelation chapter 12, you will see the connection. This woman is Mary. And in John's gospel, chapter 19, how does Jesus refer to Mary? Woman, behold your son. And son, behold your mother. So looking at the constant fate of the church, the constant fate of the church is what happened throughout the centuries. From the very early fifth into the sixth century, there was a belief of Mary dying, yes, dying, but then as they were taking her body for burial, her body disappeared. Her body was raised to the glory of God. Also in the written work of the father, there's a beautiful story that they heard an angel re reveal that Mary was going to die. So she went to sleep. And as she went to sleep, all of the apostles from every part of the world came and they were with Mary and she talked and she spoke with them. And then she went to sleep. And as she went to sleep, she died. And as she died, three days later, Jesus appeared with the apostles and Mary. And as he appeared with the apostles and Mary, Mary was taken up into heaven. So in the very early part of the church, it was known as Mary's sleep. And the word that is used, domitian. So like dormitory, a place of rest. So dormition. So in the Eastern church, early as the sixth century, they started to celebrate the sleep of Mary, the dormition of Mary. So from the fifth century, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary was celebrated in Syria. The fifth and sixth century, the apocryphal books were testimony of a certain Christian sense of the adherents felt that the body of the mother of God should lie in a sepulcher. That is a story that I just said. So they were taking the body of Mary. She died. And while they were taking the body to this sepulcher, the body was taken up into heaven. So the sixth century, the Feast of the Assumption was celebrated in Jerusalem and perhaps even in Alexandria. From the seventh century, clear and explicit testimony was given on the assumption of Mary in the Eastern Church. As I mentioned, the Feast of Domitian. The same testimony is clear also in the Western Church, Gregory of Tours. So if you do a bit of research in the Fathers of the Church concerning the assumption of Mary, you will have the written work of the fathers speaking about Mary dying, going to sleep, and then disappearing. So through the century, so that the ninth century now, the Feast of the Assumption was celebrated in Spain. And then from the 10th to the 12th century, no dispute. There was no dispute whatsoever in the Western church. There was dispute over the false epistle of Jerome on the subject. So therefore, some of the written works that were disputed, but they believed that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven. So the 12th century continuing, the Feast of the Assumption was celebrated in the city of Rome and in France. And in the 13th century, to the present, certain and undisputed faith in the assumption of Mary in the universal church. So most scholars today accept the assumption of Mary. So in 1950, Pope Pius XII, he declared infallibly ex cathedra. And last day's session, I also explained infallible, meaning without fault. Without fault, when a pope sits on 
his cathedra, his chair, and he speaks on faith and morals and doctrines. And here, Pope Pius XII, he's going to proclaim the dogma of the assumption. So this is what he says, Mary having completed the course of her earthly life was assumed body and soul to heavenly glory. Taking that statement, Mary having completed the course of her earthly life was assumed body and soul to heavenly glory. That is the dogma in a nutshell. So what is the final words? The man magisterium, this is the official teaching of the church, has stayed conspicuously silent regarding whether this process entail Mary's physical death. So the church never says anything about her physical death. The teaching merely states that Mary's body and soul was assumed at the completion of the course of Mary's life. And that is our journey. At the end of our life, we need to be purified to enter into the glory of God. Revelation 21, 27, nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. What makes a human person defiled is sin. Mary was created immaculately, immaculate conception. She did not have personal sin. So at the natural end of her earthly life, she was undefiled, so she was taken body and soul into the glory of God. So I welcome back Bernadette. So thank you very much, Father, for another enlightening session. And very much we saw that the assumption really is based on the foundation of the Immaculate Conception. Um, the Immaculate Conception, Mary was created and redeemed at the same time. What happens to us in our baptism happened to Mary at the moment of her conception. And because she was sinless, then I think that is one of the assumptions. Because she was sinless, her body itself, though she may have died, her body was not corrupt and went body and soul into heaven. Can you just elaborate a little bit further on the marriage of the two? How does that relate to us? Well, it relates to us because it is really our hope that we recognize that if we free ourselves from sin, we will enter into the glory of God. So in this life, we will be faced with many obstacle challenges, but it does not mean that we need to give in into temptation and fall into sin. Here, Mary, yes, she was immaculately conceived, but God freed her from original sin. He frees us. She would have been faced with very difficult circumstances in life, trials and tribulations. She would have been faced with temptation, but she did not give into sin. We, however, in giving into sin, Nothing defiled will enter the kingdom of God. But again, God in his merciful love gave us the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation so we can be free from sin to enter into his glory. So it gives us hope to recognize human beings that one just like us, that we can overcome sin in many facets. Yes, it will be a struggle, but with God's grace, Nothing is impossible. So that is what is the beauty of this dogma. And for us to concretize in our minds and heart that God wants us to be with him. From the very beginning, if we looked at Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were created with body and soul. And God wanted to walk with them in the cool of the evening. But because of sin, he could not walk with them in the cool of the evening. So therefore, Mary did not sin. So hence the reason that she is making this beautiful journey, this walk with God in his glory. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you for this great series that you have done, enlightening us 
on the four Marian dogmas and how we could strengthen our devotion to Mary so she can help us on our faith journey. Thank you, viewers, and we pray God's blessing and we consecrate Father and you viewers to our Holy Mother as we pray that she protects you with her mantle. She pray for you. She cover you in her mantle of love, prayer, and protection. And I thank you, organizers. Um, Father, it was an honor sharing this platform as a moderator. So now I hand over to Gary. Thank you very much, Bernadette. And all it is left for me to do at this time is to say thank you to Bernadette for expertly moderating these five sessions. Thank you very much, Bernadette. Um, and of course, Father David, for your expert knowledge on, on Marian devotion and theology and spirituality. We want to thank you very much for leading us through these sessions in this month of May, uh, May the month of Mary. So thank you very much on behalf of Credi, Office of Pastoral Planning and Development, and Campsell, the producers of Know Your Faith. So Father, could you then close the series with your final prayer? Sure. So in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So almighty ever living God, we thank you for this beautiful month of May the month of Mary, whom you have given to the whole world as mother. We ask her continual intercession as she prayed with the apostles, that she will pray with us, that we will be renewed in the spirit of God to live a life of truth so that we will bring about the kingdom here on earth. So may your mother continue to hold us in her mantle of love, interceding now and forever at the hour of our death, so we will be blessed by you. As we all say together, wherever you are, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, Mount's woman, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.